America's not unique in its sins hmm. as a country. We're not unique in our evils, to be honest with you. Um, I think where, we're, where we may be singular is our fu a refusal to acknowledge them. Hmm. Hmm. And the legends and myths we tell about our inherent you know, goodness uh, to hide and cover and conceal so that we can maintain a kind of willful ignorance that protects our innocence. See, the thing is that when we, the Tea Party was happening, we used people were we were saying pundits. Oh, it's just about economic populism. <laughs> it's not about race. <clears throat> when people knew, people knew. Social scientists were already writing that what was driving the Tea Party were anxieties about economic demographic anxiety. shifts, that the country was changing, that they were seeing these racially ambiguous babies on, on Cheerios commercials, that the country wasn't quite feeling like it was a white nation anymore. And people were screaming from the top of their lungs, you know, this is not just simply economic populism. This is the un ugly underbelly of the country. See, the thing is, is this, and I'll say this, and I'll take the hit on it. There are communities that have had to bear the brunt of America confronting, white Americans confronting the danger of their innocence. And it happens every generation. So somehow we have to kind of, oh my God, is this who we are? And just again, another, here's another generation of babies. Think about it, that two year old had his bro bones broken by two parents trying to shield him from being killed. A woman who has been married to this man for as long as I've been on the planet almost, lost her, lost her husband. For what? And so what we know is that the country has been playing politics for a long time on this hatred. We know this. So it's easy for us to place it all on Donald Trump's shoulders. It's easy for us to place Pittsburgh on his shoulders. It's easy for me to place Charlottesville on his shoulders. It's easy for us to place El Paso on his shoulders. This is us. And if we're gonna get past this, we can't blame it on him. He's a manifestation of the ugliness that's in us. I've had the privilege of growing up in a tradition that didn't believe in the myths and the legends because we had to bear the brunt of them. Either we're going to change, Nicole, or we're gonna do this again and again, and babies are going to have to grow up without mothers and fathers, uncles and aunts, friends, while we're trying to convince white folk to finally leave behind a history that will maybe, maybe, or embrace a history that might set them free from being white. Finally. Finally. What else? Lord help us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC. Welcome to Speak the Truth. This is our Memorial Day show. I'm going to turn it over. My name is Gary Johnson, your facilitator. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Harold Bell, who will take it from here. Thank you, Gary. Uh, it's Sunday, so it must be Speak the Truth. And uh, as you know, that's one of my favorite clips. <laughs> that's one of my favorite clips, because you know what? This is us. The Republicans are us. The Democrats not that far behind. We can't put it all on the Republicans. But this is us, man. As we head into this Memorial Day, this is us. You know, we, we sit around and we look and we see some of the topics that we're going to discuss today. The Tulsa race rise 100 years later. And there are people who are living in Oklahoma, 83% are not aware of Black Wall Street and how almost 300 lives were lost, 800 people wounded, all Black. They destroyed a town. And people are walking around talking about they are not aware of it. Why is that? Because this is us. This is, this is us. This is how we run America. This is how they run America. So when you stop and think about we celebrating what we remember, we ain't celebrating nothing. We remembering, remember George Floyd one year ago, how that brother was killed. 
And but we already forgot about Jimmy Lee Jackson in 1965, 35 years ago, how he was killed peacefully marching on a police station when a state trooper shot him coming out of the restaurant. No arm, no gun or anything. All of this started the civil rights voting. All of this started that, man, but we forgot all about Jimmy Lee Jackson. They forget about the ones that we've lost that stood up. And all the reason that I am sitting here today, they sacrificed their lives for us, man. And we're talking about we don't remember. We don't remember Malcolm X. All of the, those things that uh, the brother uh, from Princeton was telling us about, Malcolm X was telling us that years ago. That this is us, man. How is it, you know, George Floyd's brother made one of the most provocative and most pro profound statements that I've ever heard on his visit to the White House. You know what he said to the press after the White House? He said, we can pass a federal law protecting birds. He talking about the bald eagle. Why can't we pass a federal law to protect black folks in America? Man, how powerful was that? Something is wrong, man. We got people around thinking that, man, we done made it, man. Oh, man, we done made it, man. Look at Jay-Z. Look at uh, Oprah. Look at look at Michael Jordan. Look at Barack Obama. Man, come on. That's not the success of America. Not Black America anyway. And look how, to tell you we haven't made it, this is 2021. A black man in America today makes half the salary of a white man. In 1968, Lyndon B. Johnson came out with a commission, the Colonel Commission. He got some of his boys together. He said, you guys go into um, the ghetto and find out why are these black folks so mad? Why are they riding all around the country? I need to know. And his white boys came back with an honest update, an honest update. He said, they said the racial economic gap is unchanged since 1968. This was 1968, they said this. And here we in 2021 talking about we done made it. They told us in 1968, we were headed for two different societies in America, one white, and one black, and here we are. So as we go into this show today, I don't know where my special guest is, but I've got all the people that I need to talk about what we need to talk about today. So we got we got a smorgasbord of things that we need to deal with today, man. When you stop and think about, you know, we telling our kids to get their education, you need your education to make it. Well, let me tell you something you adults to tell your kids. You need some good white folks to make it. That's what you need. If you ain't got some good white folks in your corner, you in trouble in America, man. There is no even playing field. I'm so proud of, of Michael and what he's doing in Selma. He has put his life on the line. That trooper that killed, killed Jimmy Lee, 43 years later, Michael carried him to court and got six, got him six months. If he got him six days, that would have been a victory, but he got him six months. He got out a month early. So when we started looking around, man, we got to tell our kids the truth. That's why I say this show is speak the truth, man. This is no place for you if you if you driving around, nickel and diamond. We don't do that here. I see our special guest uh, has joined us. What I want to do, I want to I want to introduce him. He taught as an adjunct professor at three universities. He was an associate editor of Ebony Magazine and president of the New York Association of Black Journalists. He has written for numerous publications, including Jet, Essence, Black Enterprise, and Newsweek magazines, 
as well as the New York Times, the Richmond Free Press, and the New York Daily News. He is the author of the Harlem Hospital Story, 100 Years of Struggle Against Illness and Racism, Revelation to Autobiography of Alvin, Alvin Ailey, Precious Memories, Great Expectations. He also authored The Seventh Child, a family memoir of Malcolm X. He is a former 2015 National Association of Black Journalists Award winning journalist. And I want to read something um, that I found as an excerpt in his book. And this is, uh, this, this is an excerpt from Malcolm X. Malcolm said, if an American black man works as a butler in the home of a poor white man, the weak economic position of the boss will reflect itself in the overall appearance of the black butler. If the ball suddenly becomes wealthy, naturally the butler will also make more money and become wealthy. Two, he will become what we call in rich. I can't use that word. He will wear better clothes, eat better food, and perhaps house his family in a better community and his children may have access to better schools. A casual observer will think, boy, this black brother has made great material progress, but has he? His position has not changed. He is still a servant and the white man is still the boss. How can you say there has been no progress? Simply because the black man still in 2021 makes half the salary of a white man. This excerpt that I just read was to be published in the Organization of African American Unity newsletter. Our special guest was the editor of the newsletter. The excerpt was given to our special guest by Malcolm X on February 29, 1965, the day before Malcolm was assassinated. Malcolm's birthday was May 19, two days before my birthday on May 21st. I would like to welcome our special guest, A. Peter Bailey. How you doing, Peter? He has can to come off mute. We can see your name up there. We can't see you. He's got to come off mute. Peter probably had not <laughs> Yeah, take yourself off mute, Peter. Peter. Are you there, Peter? Okay, well, let's keep it, let's keep it moving, man, as, as we always do. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome once again, I would like to welcome uh, uh, District Attorney in Selma, Alabama, uh, Michael uh, Jackson. Michael, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here on, on this special Sunday because this is a special Sunday. Michael, tell us, tell us, tell us a little. Oh, can you about, see me now? Yeah, I, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, we, we just can't see you. Can't see, uh, I don't know what's going on. That's all right. Go ahead. I've already introduced you and I, I read the excerpt uh, from Malcolm. That yeah, I heard see. that, huh? And uh, tell us, uh, Peter, about this journey that you have been on with Malcolm. I know you were in New York uh, for uh, the celebration of his birthday several weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. Tell us about uh, your journey with Malcolm. Well, you know, you know, um, Harold, I always refer to him as a master teacher. And to me, there's no, no more important member of the community than a master teacher. Brother Malcolm taught us, and it's up to us to learn and understand and act on what he taught us. And, and to me, I learned from him. I learned our history. I learned something about economics. I became a journalist, directly became a journalist because of him. And I learned the, the use of words, how to be, you know, how to watch the words that you use. I remember in the very first issue of the newsletter, I wrote an article about the killing of that young boy in Harlem that, that launched the Harlem uprising in 1964. And you notice, I didn't say Harlem riot. I said Harlem uprising in 1964. And Brother Malcolm at the time was in Africa, uh, speaking to, uh, meeting African leaders about his international agenda. So he called back to the office and each one of us who was doing something had to think So when it was my turn, I read him what I had written about the uprising. And I, and I had, I said, eyewitnesses to the murder. And he stopped me. He said, no, Brother Peter, you can't say the word murder. Uh, you can't use the word murder when he's been convicted. And we know 
that he's not going to be convicted. He's not, he's going, he's not going to be uh, convicted for this. He said, and then, then he can sue you for defamation. He said, call him a killer. And he re referred to it as a killing because he's a killer and as a killing, no matter what the circumstances. And I, we scratched out the word murder and wrote killing in. And sure enough, when that cop was uh, acquitted, he sued Martin Luther King's organization and CORE for putting out a plan for describing him as a, as a uh, murderer. And that's just some of the things I learned from Brother Malcolm. And I think that, that when I, as you said before, I have taught it three different colleges, and I always try to pass this kind of information along to students when I teach them. You gotta, you gotta read. You simply cannot function in this world without doing serious reading. You can't, cell phones and you know, the new technology, they give you headlines. They don't give you depth. They'll give you headlines, then you gotta go and get some depth. And you usually can get that in this society right now by reading more. You know, that's what I always tell my students. And that's what Brother Malcolm was. I remember Brother Malcolm in, in Harlem, at, at the, there was a black owned bookstore in Harlem. The man who owned the place had to lock the door and leave him in there. He'd be in that bookstore all night reading and learning. So that's the kind of thing that we have to teach our young people today. They've got to understand that we've got to pass on to them the importance of, of doing your homework, doing research, reading, finding out what's going on in the world. <laughs> So, uh, Peter, uh, when when would you say that Malcolm X really became uh, uh, a, a major leader and a major force in Black America? What what do you think was the turning point? I I, I look at it because I wasn't there. Is that when he went to the uh, United Nations and, and how he was welcomed by those Black leaders, man, that that really uh, turned his around in America as a kind of power that, that this brother had. Yeah, I, I think that's when he, when he became recognized as, an, as, uh, as, as a, not only a national leader, but as an international, uh, international person. The fact that he was doing, because you know, his doing, when he left the Nation of Islam and formed the Organization of Afro-American Unity, we named ourselves after the Organization of African Unity, which had been founded in 1963. And then, so when we founded our organization in 1964, we called it the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And from the very beginning of that organization, its main goal, besides teaching us basic things, but its, its main international goal was to take the United States government before the UN Commission on Human Rights for, not, for, being, for being either unwilling or unable to protect the lives and property of black people. Now you remember, brother, that period between 1955 and 1965, there was some tremendous, brutal, vicious things going on in this country. And, and, and the United States was then, of course, proclaiming itself as the leader of the free world and, and the greatest democracy in the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Brother Malcolm was going to go to the UN to say, change it. And you know what they did? <clears throat> the United States at that time, and I don't think it has done it to this very day, the United States had not signed the UN Charter on Human Rights. Because if they had signed the Charter on Human Rights, then uh, and then the, Brother Malcolm could have gone to the UN himself and taken our case. But since they had not signed it, you then had to get a UN member to take your case to the UN Commission on Human Rights. So that's where he spent most of the last year of his life working with Africa, to get Africa leaders, uh, develop a kind of relationship with them, because some of them would take our case to the UN Commission on Human Rights. And uh, Dr. John Henry Clark told me after he was assassinated that he had gotten six African countries to agree to do that. And I think the fact that he was even remotely may have succeeded in this is why the United States government was fearful, extremely fearful of what he was doing. And I think they were, and that's why they were behind his assassination. It was very right. fearful because they, they were, it was a propaganda thing. They were pushing themselves as one thing and Brother Malcolm was showing that they were lying, that they were not, they were not the leader of the free world. They were, there were black folks between that period of time, uh, between 55 and 65, and all throughout history, but during that period of time, we're being treated with all kinds of things. Mega Evans was assassinated. The little girls were killed in Birmingham. Children were being mm -hmm. bitten by police dogs and fire hoses and be being hit with fire hoses in Birmingham. All of this is going on at this time. And the president of the United States was basically saying, I can't do nothing about it. And Little Rock, what happened in 1957, Eisenhower kept saying, nothing I can do, nothing I can do. That's a state thing. Then one day, somebody showed him the Russian newspaper it had nothing in, on the front page but pictures of 
what was going on in Little Rock. And all of a sudden, you know what he did? He nationalized the Arkansas National Guard to protect those, the Little Rock Nine. Kennedy did the same thing in Birmingham in 1963. Couldn't do nothing, can't do nothing, can't do nothing. But when, but when uh, it started going, getting around internationally, all of a sudden, he nationalized the Alabama National Guard to protect those kids. But the Malcolm was well aware of this. So that's why he had this international agenda of taking the United States before the UN Commission on Human Rights. And most people do not know that as a result of what he did, the African, the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, in 1964, issued a resolution condemning discrimination in the United States. That had never happened before, and it has not happened since. That was a direct result of all the groundwork laid by Brother Malcolm. And I, and that's when he wow. read, I think that's when the government realized this brother is, is a bad for our propaganda machine. We got to do something about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter, we have a great panel here. I'm quite sure they want to get in on this and ask you some questions about Malcolm. I want to go to uh, my brother down in uh, Selma, Alabama, who's a district attorney down there, Michael Jackson. Michael, will you come on in? And Gary, you can see everybody there, but I can't see everybody. So when you can tell us who's there, and who want to come on? And Ed, you can come on after Michael. Michael, are you still there? Michael's there. He just has to yeah. unmute. He's there he is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute it. I got it. Uh, okay. Let me yeah. just say this. Uh, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was a little boy. For some reason, my mom had that book. She had a lot of books in the house. And I used to grab them and read them. My mom was a teacher at the time. And uh, matter of fact, she integrated... Uh, uh, a school in uh, Greater Atlanta, uh, Brackcliffe High. She's one of the first uh, African American teachers there, and I read that book when I was a little a little boy, and uh, way before the movie came out. Because when the movie came out, they uh, it, it seemed like a lot of uh, blacks and others didn't even realize that there was a book at, that <laughs> at, that preceded it. So. I read that book, and uh, and the funny thing is I was just reading some book on Red Fox the other day, and I don't know why I did it, maybe because I watched the Sanford and Son, and, and then I found out him and Malcolm X were best buddies growing up. I mean, when they were young adults running around, and they were uh, stealing and doing stuff like that, but uh, until they both went their different ways, they were best buddies, so uh, it's a small world. And uh, maybe uh, your, your, uh, Peter can tell us about that relationship between Red Fox and Malcolm X. Well, doing, doing Brother Malcolm's street, you know, he had that street period that he had in Harlem. And, uh, and one of his street buddies was, was Red Fox. And, you know, they were running the streets together do, doing what street people were doing in those days back in, you know, in, during that time. And... Uh, and then, of course, he got arrested and put in prison. And it was while he was in prison. <laughs> but he had he had a foundation before then, though, brothers. Brother Malcolm, mother and father were 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 were, were Garveyites, you know. And 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 so he had he came out of a he had a background that included uh, some kind of seriousness. When he was staying with his sister Ella in Boston, she brought him to live with her in Boston after the mother was father was killed and the mother was put into a uh, an institution. Uh, she right. brought him to Boston. And he and that's when he you know came into Boston you know as a teenager and started running in the streets and everything. But then he was put in prison, and while he was in prison, that's when he began to change and go back to his original thing. Because I did the book on his family. His father, his father was run out of Georgia. His father was run out of Georgia because of his political activism back in the 1920s. So he came. His mother was a, was had been very politically active in Grenada, where she was from. So he came out of a background, you know, like that. And he didn't just, he, he, was, he was not just an accident. He came out of a background, man, of, of, of serious black folks. Well, what about, what about this other book that came out on Malcolm X uh, years ago? Is that a pretty accurate book? I hadn't read that. Well, there have been several. Uh, I know the one that I co-write with his nephew was called Seventh Child. A family memoir of Malcolm X, and that right. provides that provides a lot of information about the little family. We went down to Georgia and went back to the places where his father had been. His father was a preacher down there, and from what I understand, his father was a great preacher, 
you know, would you have Brother Malcolm probably got some of his his speaking thing from? His father was a great preacher, so 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 great in fact that a lot of the black churches in that area would invite him to be a guest a guest preacher on Sundays. So he came, again, I'm trying to say that he came out of a background. He did he didn't just you know just out of pop up. He had a background, and that that's included in that book, Seven Child, a family memoir of Malcolm X, which I co-wrote with his nephew Rodnell Collins, who is the son of sister. Sister Ella Collins, the sister that he went to live with in Boston. Mm -hmm. Well, the final question I asked about is, uh, what was his relationship to uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King? Because I know uh, Malcolm at some point came to sell. So what was their relationship, you would say? Okay. Uh, they only met that one time, that famous photograph of them. They were, they, were, they were at the airport. Both of them were rushing to get to planes. So they really just kind of shook hands, said hello, and kept on moving. And that's where that famous photograph comes from. Right. But, but, but they were, my position from everything I've learned through the years is they were slowly moving towards each other. And most people don't know that brother, when Dr. King was, was arrested and put in jail in Selma, uh, when he was marching uh, in Selma, Brother Malcolm went to Selma. Right. But the, but, the, but the police would not let him go to, to the jail to see Dr. King. He met Mrs. King, and he talked to some of Dr. King's supporters. And he also spoke that evening at Brown's Chapel, which was the right. headquarters for SCLC, Dr. Martin Luther King's organization in Selma. So I think, and, and then uh, I, I, I truly believe, and I found out later from, from uh, uh, that there were people in Brother Malcolm's camp and, and Dr. King's camp who were having very, very, quiet meetings with each other. And, uh, and, and I always tell people, I don't know if they ever would have been buddy buddies, yeah. but I think if they had worked together, man, that would have been powerful. And right. let, me tell you, let me tell you who was afraid of that. J. Edgar Hoover. In a book by a British writer named Anthony Summers, J. Edgar Hoover, there's, only, there's about a 500 page book, there's only one mention of Brother Malcolm in that book. But it says this, that J. Edgar Hoover had a meeting with Senator Lyndon Johnson. So if it was Senator Lyndon Johnson, that means that it had to happen before 1960 because Johnson became vice president in 1960. So in, in, in some in the late 1950s, J. Edgar Hoover at this, at this luncheon meeting with Senator Lyndon Johnson, he said, and this is what the, I'm quoting, this is Hoover's, what Hoover said to Johnson, quote, we wouldn't have any problem and we could get those two guys fighting, and we could get them to kill one another off. End of quote. Those two guys were Brother Malcolm and Dr. King. Mm -hmm. When they couldn't get them fighting, you know what happened. Right. Edward? Mm. Hey, Edward? Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I can't help but tell Mr. Billy how uh, humble I am to be in, be in this panel. I, I have, as a journalist, I have so much respect for what Mr. Bailey has done with his career and actually with his life. He's, he's dedicated himself to telling the truth. He's dedicated himself to spreading the history of the one of the most important human beings that ever walked the face of this earth, Mr. Malcolm X. I also want to recognize that we have on this panel a couple of friends of mine, uh, Attorney Kichi uh, Taifa and Dr. Judy Fisher. These are very good friends of mine. I'm glad they joined me. Mr. Bailey, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, what exactly did Malcolm X mean when he said, by any means necessary? I'd like to have another couple of follow-up questions. For that. OK. Uh, before I answer that, I'd just like to say something real quick. I just found out that our, our host, Harold, has just received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Association of Black Journalists. So I think we should give him some, some, some plays for that. He has got a, a, an award uh, from, the, from the, the National Association of Black Journalists. Congratulations, Howard. Yeah, five years after you, uh, Peter Bailey. You, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I understand you were awarded in uh, 2015. So yeah, thank I you. Think it was, I think it was 2015. I'm not exactly sure, but I did get one. Yeah, <laughs> OK. Yeah, I was honored. I was honored. Go ahead and uh, deal with um, by, by any means by any means necessary. Basically, mean you know it's a phrase, you know that's, that that brother Malcolm is basically saying that that when you're fighting to get rid of an oppressor, 
you have to be willing and able to use all kinds of different methods to do so. And you have to, you know, find, pick your way and find the different things that you need to do or you have to do in order to, to accomplish that goal of getting that oppressor off your back. That's all it meant. But does that include, By any means necessary. Does that include, I think that what, 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 what so many of us, I think, sometimes uh, seem to, what we as the Black people, to me, some often too much forget. We spend so much time, so much, spend so much of our time uh, talking about the horror stories about what white people have done, and we know those horror stories. But, but we, let's say we have a two-day conference, and everybody comes up with a horror story about what white people have done, but nobody talks about solutions. We need, to, we need to get together, man, at a conference of black folks where you start off the conference by saying, white supremacy is no good. White people have been loud. Many, most of them in this country are white supremacists have done some terrible things to us black people. Now, we've said that. And, and we, don't hear, we don't want to hear that no more for the next two days. All we want to talk about for the next two days is what are we going to do about it? I agree with you 100%. So what would Malcolm X say to us today what are the top three things we should do to change our, our destiny from a people who are oppressed and who continue to talk about oppression and create great art about oppression, the blues. We created such a, a genre of, of, of dialogue and, and, and speaking about what has happened to us and what has been done to us. I don't think there's any people on the face of earth who haven't turned all of this communication about what's what our legacy of suffering in America has been, uh, then black people who created all kinds of art. So where do we go from here? What would Malcolm I think do? I think one of the one of the most important things he would be telling us is that we must have we must develop more unity as a group of people. We simply must. He I remember he wrote a letter in 1963. He wrote a letter to the civil rights leader. Now this is when he's still in the nation of Islam. He wrote a letter to the civil rights leaders, Dr. King, Roy Wilkins, uh, Whitney Young, and those folks. And he said to them, if capitalistic Kennedy and communistic Khrushchev can get together and talk about common things that they need to do, what, why can't we do the same thing? It is oh, just, and he, invited them, he invited them to come to a, a Nation of Islam meeting in Harlem. And he said, I guarantee you, you will be treated with respect. There would be no booing or anything. We need to talk. That's what the, 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 the thing about unity is extremely important for him. Uh, uh, for him. And, and, and uh, that's why he made it. As I said, he was, he was making moving slowly towards dealing with, with Dr. King because he understood that he, he, they were not going to go very far. Each one going his way. They need to work together. And, we, and to this day, man, we, we have not been able to understand that, that concept of unity. Number two, look at Malcolm, believe very strongly, very strongly in the importance of educating and teaching our, ourselves and especially our children. We do not do enough. We, we, we rely on the public school system to teach our history to our children. It will never happen. It will never happen. If our children are going to learn our true history, like about Tulsa and all those things, we're going to have to do it in our churches and sororities and fraternities and civic organizations and business organizations, et cetera. We're going to have to do it. And the development of the mind, Brother Malcolm was the first person that I heard who spent almost as much time talking about attacks on the mind as he did attacks on the, uh, on the body because he understood that one of the most important weapons that white supremacy has used against us is psychological attacks. And you don't hear anybody today, no leader with a national platform talks about attacks on the mind. None of them. Psychological attacks. And as a result of that, we see a lot of the stuff we see going on today is, is based not so much on physical attacks from white supremacists, but psychological attacks. Uh, and, I have and, one follow up. But by any means necessary, did uh, Malcolm X include physical force, uh, violence against white supremacy? No, he, he, he believed self-defense. Okay. Okay. Malcolm, that's Malcolm, that's no, no kind of it was not the type of person who's gonna tell folks you got to go out and start killing. And when you outnumbered by about fifty to one or ten to one, whatever it is, but he believed you had every single right to defend yourself against any kind of attacks 
from white supremacists. That included physical attacks and, and, and psychological attacks. He did not believe that in the whole concept of letting them commit violence and then, you know, hope that things will get better. You no, know, he believed that if they attacked you, you had every right to attack them. Uh, not to attack them, but to defend yourself. Yes, sir. Thank you. I don't that. believe that. In fact, in the OAAU, in the OAAU uh, a board of board of uh, our goal of goal and objectives of the OAAU, there's a whole section on the importance of self defense. And let me give you one quick quote about Brother Malcolm. I want to give about, about his belief on the mind. He said that he said that uh, if your mind is armed, you are never unarmed. That's powerful, brother. If your mind is armed from gaining knowledge, then you are never unarmed. That's the Brother Malcolm quote. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Can I say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Dr. Judy Fisher. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. When I heard about your program, I excitedly call uh, Sergeant's <laughs> mother, and together we found you. Uh, I, I, I am a minister. I like to say this. I'm a graduate of Howard University four times over, and I'm 80 years old. And I have just this year, thank God for the pandemic for me in a way, sat down and really began to think about who I am mm. as a Black woman. And I got hold of Trevor Noah's book, and I read that book. And when I came out of that book, I came out fighting myself. My whole tone, my whole nature of preaching has changed because I realized that for years, for decades, I had been suppressing my true identity as a Black person. I realized that, with, you say with Muhammad Ali, one of the reasons and I realized this because I went to Howard University School of Divinity and it was not much emphasis put on reading his work. But I realized that we as a black people, especially the black church, we were sidestepped. We sidestepped that man because he was a Muslim. We had more, we had focused more on his practice of religion than what the man was all about. And when I realized what happened, you talk about having a repentant spirit. I had been literally living every day, reading books, trying to find out who I am. I even really got my DNA because I want to know what African tribe I came out of. I was desperate because I finally recognized. And I began to preach to my people, listen, we have to prepare ourselves. Number one, you got to prepare yourself to be able to fit. We need doctors. My husband was a doctor. We need doctors, we need teachers, we need politicians, we need psychotherapists, we need people of African descent and all of these positions so we can flex our muscles. We don't have to run to the, the, the white military when we need something. We should have black folks set up and do it. And I don't mean fly by, I'm sorry, I'm getting excited. I don't mean fly by night people. I mean people who really know the market. I myself have been discriminated against red line. When I had a credit rate of 100 and, uh, no, 830, 831, and I was turned down by Bank of America after paying mortgage for 24 years to that same company, never missed a payment, never late. Now you tell me why they turned me down. I even had nerve to be turned down by a stupid cell phone company for a $500 phone with, with my credit score sitting in 800 because of my address after I had been with them for 10 years. So there are things like this. We need to be able to go to people like us who understand. We need more psychotherapists. We need more social workers. We need more people who, won't, who know who they are, will know our culture and, 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 and say, I am going to be an instrument in the change for our people. I am going to fight. We, we have to be mentally prepared to do that because it, unfortunately too many of our people, as soon as they get ahead in the world, they get all wrapped up in buying their Rolls Royces, their fancy cars. Look, and, and don't get me talking about preachers now. Don't get me talking about preachers. There should not be one big church where there's a pastor riding a Rolls Royce or riding some big car when there are people in this congregation where the children have not, their tuition has not been paid. There should not be a family in a, one of these big churches that has never gone to school and got not only a master's degree, but a PhD. We should be pumping out the next generation to be fighters for us. Not sitting on your laws because you wrote a book or you speak well and, 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 and pimping the people. I'm sorry. Yeah, I am a, I'm a Pentecostal minister. 
and I, and I don't mind saying it, it's too much of it. Pimping people on their faith, it is a shame. It's not only here in the U.S., it's in our African countries, it's in the Caribbean yeah. countries as well. Yeah. My yeah. husband was Jamaica, and, 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 I, and I know what I'm, what I'm talking about. So yes. we, we have to have a mind change. Our hearts got to be changed. That's what it is. We got to become serious. I am so furious about what's going on there. And I wake up and God, what can I do? I'm going to get me a podcast. Look out, Edward, I'm coming for you. And I'm going to call my attorney to find out what I should say and what I can't say because I'm going to let it all out. I am sick of sitting still at 80 years old and watching these people do nothing. And the Democrats got to hear from me because they ain't doing anything either. Thanks, you, Dr. Let me stop pussyfooting around and get that orange haired man out the way and let these people walk over them. Like I'm going to call you as soon as we finish, Dr. Fish. I'm, I'm going to call. I'm I'm Thank you. <laughs> okay, Peter, you want to respond to him? Peter, Peter, you want to respond to him? <laughs> I think she, I mean, she's absolutely right. I, that's my ah. position. That's, that's what I meant when I say that when we get together, instead of talking about what the system has done, because we already know that, we should spend our time talking about what are we going to do Ooh. as a people. I, I believe we should have a national organization and that organization have different divisions. There should be a, a cultural division, an economic division, a political division, an education division, a legal division, a communications division, mm -hmm. a technology division, and a yeah. self-defense division. Yes. And each one of these divisions should be staffed by people who have, who have both a, a knowledge in the area and commitment to our people. And, 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 and if we had something like that going, man, we would, we would improve our situation tremendously. And we tremendously. don't need to get everybody. All we need to get is, find, we, in fact, what we need to do first is say, we, have an, uh, we want to get together the people who, who are, who are Afrocentric or who, who believe in unity. For, mm -hmm. And you come to, if you don't believe in that, then stay home. This is not an educational thing. See, one thing, we, one, one mistake I think we too often make as a people, and I know, because I did it myself back in the 70s and 80s, you try to do something, and you always feel like you got to get the masses. You got to get the grassroots. Mm -hmm. We went for all that. Instead of, you got, I got 20, they say I got 20 young people that I'm talking to. Five are serious. The other 15 are like, well, and, you know what I did? I'm trying to change the other 15. I should have taken the five and gone on and done something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And so many times things would fail because you got 20 people. Now, you know, 15 of them are not serious. But right. you, you plan something that takes 15 people, then it fails. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yes. If you got 20 right. people there and you know only five are serious, then whatever you plan got to be something that five people can pull off. That's true. And then people say, oh, man, you try to write people off. I'm not writing anybody off. I'm saying that you got to be committed. If you if you come along later and want to join, then that's fine. But I'm not, I am, I'm, I'm 80, Dr. Fisher says she's 80, I'm 83. I have no time to convince anybody anymore. I want to talk to the true believers. I want to get the true believers organized. I want to get the committed, serious, yeah. true believing black folks organized. I don't care if they ain't but a million of us. If we get a million of us true believers organized, we can do a hell of a lot. I agree. I agree. And the other thing is this. We have to now. This is this is where I come in because I lectured on human sexuality for years in the D.C. public school abroad and all this business. We like you said, we got to stop focusing on what has happened to us. I want to get back in the school system and with an organization. I want to talk to these young people and tell them, I'm sick of hearing your excuses why you are doing drugs, why you are drinking like a fool, why you are pimping your bodies, why you are all wrapped up in this rapping. These rappers need to be rapping about what we can do, not teaching our young. Have you heard these kids cursing? These babies are walking around here with speaking obscenity and cannot put a sentence together. How are we going to introduce them into education, to, to speaking well, and to writing and reading books? When they want to watch TV, they want to rap, watch the rappers. These babies can do everything the rappers do. All these dances where they're out there just short. Get something up here in your head. We've got to put a focus on that. We used to be a people of morals of values, and it's nothing wrong with being moral. It's nothing wrong with women dressing modestly. It's nothing wrong with men looking nice. I get sick of seeing guys with their drawers, their pants hanging down, showing their underwear. I don't want to see your nasty underwear. What is that all about? I don't want to see these women with these muffins showing. Talking about it's a beauty spot. Beauty spot, Michael, well, that's just an excuse for your gluttony. And we need to get our minds right. And as a preacher, it is my right, it is my duty 
to start preaching that way. Don't come to my house and I'm going to lay hands on you and pray that Jesus is going to bless you. No, you get your, your nasty self together. Put your mind together. And if you don't believe like I believe, believe in yourself. If you want to go to hell, go ahead. I'm not going to try to put you in heaven, but I want to tell you how to get your life together and how to make something of your black behind instead of complaining about having to live in slums and, and getting a check every month. Okay. I came from the Barry Farms, okay. and I got four degrees from Howard University because I dared to not give in to being poor the rest of my life. Thank you. Right. Uh, Gary, who else is out there we need to bring in? Uh, Dr. Fish, I'm 83 years old, baby. You ain't by yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Good company. We've got a lot of folks here. We've got uh, we've got CJ. We've got Sister Taifa. We've got Charles, Eric Campbell, Carl White. Bring CJ, you want to get in? And then we can go with Sister Taifa. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I can jump in. It is a lot, lot said. I, I don't know exactly where where I to jump in. Um, for for the um, Malcolm X portion, um, one one of the questions I um would have is uh, as an expert, Mr. Bailey, what would you think Malcolm X would think of some of the so-called black leaders we've had that are more side on the side of capital and side on the side of protecting the status quo, maybe like a Barack Obama, who is constantly telling you know people like, well, we progress is you know we need to calm down. Let's go slower. Let's go more moderation. Let's um, do things like that. And then on the second half of the conversation, just on, on what Dr. Fisher talked about. Also, um, if you're doing that podcast, I'd like to sign up for that. That's, that sounds quite entertaining. Great, great. But um, in terms of the youth, in terms of the music and culture, in terms of the music industry, as someone who makes music, the, the music industry is only going to push what, what is profitable. The people that run the music, music industry are, are old white guys. Those yeah. are the guys that pick what's hot. They pick who's hot. They pick what's spun on the radio. They pick who wins Grammys and that that shapes black culture. So they're going to have an incentive if they want to keep people dumbed down is to promote the rappers that have the dumbed down music and uh, to put them in the front of the line. Not to say that they're all dumbed down and they're not intelligent people or can't make good music, but they're trying to make money and they're going to make the music that sells and that's what sells. And it's a cycle of, of economic conditions mm -hmm. that that's what the kids will emulate and that's what they'll know in the hood and that's what's going to be popular. And, you know, it's kind of a vicious cycle in that regard, although there are positive rappers who have vast vocabularies and people that follow them. But in terms of who the industry is going to promote, they're going to promote what is in their best interest. Mm -hmm. And um, also, it, there are some different economic conditions. I, I hear a lot about kids complaining about this and that, but the price of college to, uh, was a lot different back in your day than it was in our day. There's an average of $30,000 of student loan debt for anyone just to go to school today, not to mention the price of um, inflation, the, the how wages have gone down in terms of how our uh, generation has the vast less amount of wealth in the economy than your previous generations did. And it's getting worse and worse and worse with income inequality and no one's addressing it. Even Biden has recently given up on raising the minimum wage or giving anybody health care. A lot of the, he's, he's given up on canceling any student loan debt. It looks like some of the key promises that uh, would be very helpful, especially to the younger generation. So as there are lazy people that will always complain and not pull their weight, there are some vast e economic circumstances that are causing the vast wealth inequality divide and the divide in terms of culture and what young people view and in terms of what the older generations as young people are less religious, they are less trusting of the government and institutions because of how we've grown up through 9-11 and drug war and a, a bunch of things that um, have kind of blown the lid off in the internet era where we've have more access to information. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. There is more access to pull yourself out via information, but at the same time, there's less money going around. The jobs we get pay less to even get a proper education it requires to go into vast amounts of debt that can't be forgiven. So there, there's a lot of different factors involved. Okay, guys, we're running out of time. Gary, move on to somebody else. Uh, uh, let's, let's try to get everybody in. Gary, move on to somebody else you can see. How about sisters? Am I pronouncing correctly, Taifa? Taifa, are you? Yeah, I'm just. I'm on. Uh, greetings. Yes, thank you, thank you, brother Eddie Sargent, for uh, inviting me. I'm, it's always a pleasure uh, to join this group. Always love to hear Peter Bailey every time uh, I hear him. Thank you so much. It's so very nostalgic. I mean, nostalgic. Not that I was around at that time, but. I know people who were like my dear brother um, mentor, um, Herman Ferguson, 
who I know was part of the OAAU, Sister Yuri uh, Kochiyama. But the question, Brother um, Peter, I want to ask you is about the Henry brothers and um, Milton Henry in, in particular, who I know traveled with um, Brother Malcolm uh, throughout his international travels and also who I understand was responsible for uh, recording that last speech that Malcolm gave, um, known by different names, but most popularly by Message to the Grassroots in Detroit, um, that was ultimately produced by Barry Gordy and um, a Motown. Can you tell us whatever you know about that and Herman Ferguson or Milton Henry, um, also known as Gaidi Obadeli, if you could just share whatever you can, because I personally was greatly influenced by a movement that came after Malcolm that my understanding was greatly influenced by Malcolm, the Republic of New Africa. So if you could share some of that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'll just be very, you know, since I know the time is, uh, Yuri Koshiyama was Mary Koshiyama. She was a Japanese American woman whose family had been in, in put in a con, uh, uh, in concentration camp uh, in, 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 during World War II. And uh, she lived in Harlem. She and her husband and their three children, and they became very, very close to the, they, they, never, they never joined the OAU, but they were very close to the OAU, and she, she became a very, very strong supporter of what we were doing. And she was a part of an organization called the Japanese African American Society, which was an organization of people of Japanese descent in this country who were so strongly supporters of what was going on, and especially with what Brother Malcolm was doing. And uh, uh, Herman Ferguson, Herman was, a, was the, the uh, chairman of our newsletter. Not our newsletter, I'm sorry, I was the editor of newsletter. Herman was the chairman of our education committee. And, and he put together a program, and to this day, I don't know how to contact any of these people, but 10 people got a certificate from that program signed by Brother Malcolm for having completed the program uh, uh, set up by the OEAU that Herman and them set up. And we never know what happened to those people. They got something that's very, you know, strictly from a, from a, a, a uh, perspective of, you know, m memorabilia, they got something that's extremely important, uh, those 10 people. Uh, Herman, uh, I, don't, I forgot the other person that you asked me about. Uh, Mary, has, Mary has, has passed. Herman is Milton, Milton Henry, Milton Henry Milton from Henry. Detroit. Yeah, I, I, you might not have known him, but I, yeah. I did yeah, not right. know him, but I knew, I love him. I know he was a strong supporter of Brother Malcolm and he made that, that valuable contribution to the release. I think that album, uh, the last album that Brother Malcolm was recorded before he died, that speech that he gave out there in Detroit. I think it was on February the 15th that he gave a speech in Detroit, that uh, February 15th, 1965, which is what? six days before his assassination. Uh, and so he was very, very important uh, supporter of, of Brother Malcolm's. Okay, Darren? Yeah, we also have um, Mr. White. Carl White's been on for a while. If he can be unmuted. Carl White? Calling on Carl White. Look Carl like trying, but we'll keep it moving, I guess. We've got uh, Eric Campbell. we got Brother Charles. we got Jacques. Oh, Jacques. I know Jacques wants to come in. <laughs> come on in, Jacques. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Mm -hmm. I truly enjoyed the, uh, the history of uh, uh, Brother Malcolm X, and I definitely agree with uh, what our elder callers or season. My wife always tell me to be careful. I say older people and elder people. I, was, I like to say season now, especially since my daddy was a Creole out of Louisiana. He used to season that food up good. And this history uh, and knowledge that you're all are spreading is definitely season. And you're right. Uh, we do have to quit idolizing uh, certain people. And that goes from Barack to your Jay-Z's and uh, and, and to uh, uh, some of the, uh, and I'm going to speak of Al Sharpton and others who are just constantly on television to me. Uh, a proper uh, gandanizing themselves. Uh, even the guy that's so-called uh, label that he's given this guy uh, uh, that's representing all these people being killed by black cops, Ben Crump, to label him the civil rights attorney for black people. You know, I, I didn't uh, elect this guy my civil rights uh, uh, attorney, uh, the AG for black people. And I think that this guy's now coming on, and some of these people are coming on television bragging right. just today. They had an article about Jay-Z 
buying a $25 million Rolls Royce, him and Beyonce, and they <laughs> overcharge black poor people to come to their concert, three, $400 now, to come to their concert for an hour and a half, two hours, absolutely pimping in the, 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 the just the, the imp -imp degree. And so that's something that just irritates me to no end. And the poverty preachers and pimps you know, I, I uh, uh, you know, could go on and on, but I, that's just what I wanted to get in. And with that said, my mic is back on mute. Thank you, Jock. Okay, who else we got, Gary? Uh, it's Charles, are you there? I saw Charles early. He's coming on. There yeah, we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. First, of all, I want to acknowledge uh, the Reverend Fisher, Dr. Fisher. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to you about the uh, the black churches and their positions that they're taking. Um. I'm really uh, adamant about that. You, you got a big black church and uh, you ride by the street and you see people poor on the side, kind of remind me of the, uh, the Good Samaritan, which you are not. Uh, but in terms of, uh, of Mr. Bailey, I want I want you to talk about the old, old AAU economic program because uh, Dr. Fisher spoke on that. But I want you to talk about that because I do recall that in your platform, y'all had an economic program that, as well as a political program, y'all were setting up. Can you talk? Can you speak on that? Uh, yes, brother. Uh, all I can say is uh, it was a part of our, our agenda. Brother Malcolm strongly believed in the absolute importance of economics. That's why it's in our program. One of the things today is that everybody, most of the black people, they all we talk about is electoral politics. We practically never talk about economics and culture. Again, as I said, the nobody with, with a major platform talks consistently about uh, psychological warfare. No one with a national program talks consistently about economics and culture. I always tell, I tell people constantly, you will never, and, and Brother Malcolm recognized this, that's why it's included in our agenda. And he talked about that we had to have our own, you know, we had to keep the money within our community. Uh, and, and, and I try to tell people over and over again, brother, learning from Brother Malcolm, you will never, 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 never in this society have political power without economic power. You may have a limited degree of political influence, but you will never have political power without economic power. And if you have economic power, you automatically have political power in this society. And, uh, and, and, and we need to learn that. I learned that from Brother Malcolm. He talked, he, he talked about economics many times in his speeches as he talked about psychological warfare. It's things that you don't hear hardly anybody who have national platform talking about today, economics and psychological warfare. None of them. And to, to some degree, that's our fault. Yeah. I, 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 some, I've reached a point, and sometimes people think that I've gotten kind of cynical. But sometimes when things happen now, and people say, you see what they did on it? You know what I say? This is what happens to a group of people who resolutely refuse to organize a national movement to promote and protect their interests. Well, you know, black people ain't going to do that. Then you have to pay the consequences. <laughs> mm hmm I want to. I want to. I want to jump in right here. I want to say, you know, one thing, Peter. We're so busy being exclusive instead of inclusive. Gary, I want you to run that clip on Muhammad Ali and uh, and Malcolm X. Because people are always asking about that relationship, and I didn't realize that Malcolm had carried Muhammad Ali with him to the United Nations. Let's run that clip. <clears throat> You've been invited to a number of. Yes, sir. Countries such as uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan, Malaya. Uh, when do you plan Egypt to go? In all these countries. When do you plan to uh, go? In a couple of months, I like to start my world tour, and I expect to be gone for as long as a whole year. Cassius, uh, controversy, not controversy, but there's great interest in the fact that you have joined the Muslim religion. How long have you had this interest, Cassius? Oh, for the past six years, I would say, after hearing a lot of teachings on Negro history and who we were before we got here, and one and one makes two, and here I met nothing but Muslims from all over the world, and they all... You mean here at the United Nations yes, today? Uh, I recognize all of them, and they recognize me, uh, but until then, I could walk in here and wouldn't know nothing about what's going on, but now I can look at people from all over the world, regardless of the race, creed, or color, and talk intelligently with them, and most of all, recognize all of my brothers and sisters in the East, people that I haven't recognized over my lifetime. Cassius, you, uh, there's some talk about your buying a home here. Is uh, Have you made the purchase yet? Well, yes, I'm a uh, lip uh, scout now, and some, some home on outskirts of town I'll soon be picking. Is, is this the reason for your, this particular trip to New York? 
Well, yes, I have enterprise set up here. I'm incorporated now and I have a lot of business to attend to. And like I said, this is the center of the world. A whole lot is going on here. And, uh, this is the city. You're winning the championship. You feel your affiliation with the Muslim religion? Being a follower of the Muslim religion had something to do with your winning the championship? Well, I would say so. Uh, my religion is what the only thing that I can give me credit for pulling me through because uh, the 99 out of 100 seemed to see no possibility of me winning. The newspaper reporters and everybody all over the world condemned me. They said it would be a mismatch and everybody, couldn't nobody believe it. So uh, my prayers to uh, uh, Allah and uh, faith in my religion, living a clean, righteous life, I have to say that's what pulled me through. Do you think you, uh, you'll have to go in the army before you fight again? Have you, do you know yet? Well, I really don't know. I'll cross those bridges when I get to them. <laughs> Fine. Thank you very much, Cassius. Yes, it's been sir. real nice to have you Thank here you as, a, as, a, as a representative of the, of the boxing world. Thank yes, you. sir. Malcolm, could I talk to you? Yes, sir. United Nations and organizations well, dedicated to brotherhood and to, to world peace. Well, as I, heard, you as I heard you explaining to Cassius this afternoon about, uh, first, the ability to sit down and discuss the problem. Well, this is what this is what makes the UN what it is. They discuss the problem. Whether they don't, whether they disagree or not, they at least discuss the problem. And uh, But America needs to do the same thing on a domestic level where the race problem is concerned. They need to discuss the problem, but they don't need to discuss it with Uncle Tom whom they themselves have placed up as spokesmen for Negroes. Because that time is not going to say anything but what his master wants him to say. And you can't get to the root of a problem by listening to some parrot uh, say what you've already told it to say. So the first thing they've got to do is discuss the problem, analyze it, uh, get to the root of it, and then they can come up with a solution. And the only one, the only black America, who will spell out the real causes of the problems and the facts of the problem is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We'll talk about the Muslim religion, uh, those following the Muslim religion being purveyors of hate. I wonder if you'd declare that for Cassius has been following the religion of Islam, the Muslim religion, for the past four or five years. And he's, the most, he's always been the most likable, friendly person in the world. And I think you'll find that all Muslims uh, who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have the ability to make friends with everyone. Where did this come from, the title of the Muslims being a hate group? Well, the press, uh, the anti-Muslim uh, press, uh, tried to paint that distorted image purposely to, to make the, most of the Negroes in this country afraid to be identified with it. What is this? But Cassius, uh, Cassius destroyed that image the other night when he knocked out listening, Sonny Liston. Same connection, Malcolm. Would you, uh, would you clarify this charge that has been made? Are you free now to, to speak? Uh, yes. All right. That was uh, Malcolm X and uh, Muhammad Ali uh, at the United Nations. Uh, this coming week, uh, our dear friend, my dear friend, and the greatest uh, will be he did five years, so we need to remember him and, and what he meant to all of us, you know, black and white. You know, I never heard Muhammad Ali uh, come down talking about he hate white folks. I never heard that. I, I wasn't around um, Malcolm X that much. I, I know my sister saw him in passing, but Muhammad Ali, I spent a lot of time with, more than any other sports journalist. So, you know, he never talked about hating white folks, man. And it was so great to see. I didn't know that he had gone to uh, the United Nations uh, with Malcolm X. Come on back in, uh, Peter. Well, I like it just on what you just finished saying. Brother Malcolm had a statement which I included in a column that I wrote. And he, it was addressed to what he called sincere whites. He said that sincere whites should join, find other people who are sincere like they are, and then they should work together, and then they should go after the people in their communities who are, who are white supremacists. And, but that they would never, they had absolutely no intention there being any white members of the OAAU. And that's mm -hmm. the bottom line. So he did say that, you know, that sincere white, then you've got to work in, you don't have to come to our community to work. You work in your community. That's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. They all want to come, to, they, they, the white, so-called white liberals and progressives, they want to come into the black community and do that. No, no, no. You stay over there and work and find other sincere whites mm -hmm. like you are. And then y'all work. To, to deal with the white supremacists in your, in your, in your, among your people, you know, and that's what position that Brother Malcolm took. And, uh, and, and, and to me, Brother Malcolm uh, was a, was a Pan-African Muslim, uh, just like some people are Pan-African Christian. To me, the identity is, is the most important identity is Pan-African, which means that you think people of African descent around the world have some kind of unity. You're not a, you're, you're, you're a Pan-African Ghanaian, a Pan-African Nigerian, a Pan-African Jamaican, a Pan-African Muslim, a 
Pan-African Christian, uh, a Pan-African uh, scholar, you know, but that's got to be the one that, that ties us together because in the eyes of the, of the, of the, the rest of the world, and that includes Asia, Europe, and North America, they look upon Africa as a place to be exploited. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the only way that's going to stop is for a strong connection, especially between African people on the continent and people of African descent in North America. We are the key to the advancement. Brother Malcolm believed this fully, fully believed this. And that's why he spent so much time. He spent over six months of the last year of his life traveling in Africa and meeting and talking to African leaders. And that's why they issued a resolution under, with his, because of his statements uh, condemning discrimination in the United States, uh, something that had never happened before or since. And that's why when he was in, in, in May 1964, he had audiences, brothers and sisters, not, not meetings, I meet you at a reception, we shake hands, then we move on. He had audiences ranging from one and a half hours to three hours with presidents in Zikwe of Nigeria, Nasser of Egypt, and Kruma of Ghana, Nyeri of Tanzania, uh, Ture of Guinea, Kenyatta of Kenya, and uh, Prime Minister Oboto of, uh, of uh, Uganda. Hey, hey, Peter, I want to ask you, uh, you, you did a, a column in the Informer newspaper about a month ago, and you were talking about the homicides in Chicago and how the big six could come together and, and prevent some of this mayhem that's been taking place in Chicago for decades. Tell us about that column and who were the big six that you were talking about? Okay, uh, it was a column for the, I write a column for the Trice Etney Wire Service, which is a wire service owned by a, a, a friend of mine. Uh, just like a kind of now like a black. Hear you. you want to talk to them? No, that's okay. You're done with this now? I'm done. Now go ahead, Peter. We'll bring okay. Carl in later. Go ahead, Peter. Keep going. Okay, it's like a, it, the, he, I wrote a column for the Trice Eddie Wire Service, which is like a black AP, in which I said that Chicago for years has had this horrific situation where young low-income black males are killing other young low-income black males, and occasionally some other person get caught in the middle of it. And I say it, it can become a it can become like a place where where we can do something that can then be used around other places around the country. And I say the people who can do this are what I call the big six. They can set up in Chicago a state-of-the-art community center where young black people can go and learn history. They can learn technology. Uh, they can meet each other in, 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 in social settings. Just a place about for the neighborhood. And then the big six are Oprah Winfrey, Jesse Jackson, Louis Farrakhan, Michael Jordan, Barack Obama, and Michelle Obama. They all have international reputations. They all have big time financial resources. They all have people, a lot of people who listen to them. If they would get together, not individually, if they would get together and, 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 and go to Chicago and say, hey, we're going we gonna to build and staff a serious community center here in Chicago. That would do more than all the rhetoric, all of the talk, all of the television thing. To, to really bring about a change and, and could become then they say that that can happen in other places around the country. Yeah, that sounds great. That's that sounds great. Good. Well, we got to get ready to get out of here, but I want to bring Carl in. Carl White, come in, and then we're going to go around, we're going to go around the room and they will give everybody a minute to close out, okay? Carl, come on in, Carl, if you can. If you can Carl's go. jumped off. Carl, 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 he dropped off. Okay, let's go around the room, Gary, and give everybody a minute to close out. All right, Jock, go ahead. Again, thank you, uh, everyone. And I just, I, I think that uh, the uh, major six folks that Peter Bailey was speaking of is uh, definitely something I always thought in my mind, too. We just had a few people that were very influential uh, to say that, you know, we're going to stop some of this madness and uh, uh, this collection of wealth that just goes to a handful of people, which is why I commented about some folks who I call poverty pimps. I know it's not exactly popular to talk about these people who have great money, great power, but I just think it's so wrong that you're accumulating, you're doing the same thing that you know white folks are doing, you're accumulating all this wealth, but then you're not sharing it or helping uh, bring others up. So that's what my comment is, I'll be quiet, I'm, I'm muted. All righty, we got 60 seconds or less. Ed Sargent, come on. 
Off mute. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everybody. This has been a good mix. It's like a good gumbo of uh, of black power, mental power, as uh, Peter Bailey has uh, continued to speak to about the psychological warfare that's being plagued upon us that makes us feel that we can't do what we need to do, and that we can't figure out what we need to do. Indeed, we can. I think that's the main message that Malcolm X left. He would have been 96 years old today. Yeah, I think it would have been like our 80 plus people here on the line. Don't take any more mess. Just let it all hang out and be for real. So thank you very much. Okay. We got Selma DA, Michael Jackson, followed by CJ and then Dr. Fisher. And we'll keep it rolling. Well, I just want to say I agree with uh, Peter and uh, the, the pastor about the fact that young people, one thing we're going to have to do is stress them reading reading books. I think all these schools should make kids read and write a one-page report each week about what they have read. I think that's the way to uplift us and put us on a level playing field. And that's my comment. Thank you so much, Michael. CJ, Dr. Fisher, followed by Charles. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what was said. I think the reading uh, aspect was a great point that was just made. I think um, that is kind of underutilized in our internet era that everyone has phones and tablets and, you know, they, they don't pick up a good book. And then just expanding your vocabulary can give you a leg up just in the political sphere of getting through the, the BS that, that comes through that people try to spend to you with their rhetoric. So um, my last point is just uh, I agree that we need to focus on what brings us together and our common ground rather than what divides us in terms of religion and political ideologies and try to uh, unite. Like I said, it's about organizing and unite, uniting together for a common agenda. Okay. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. And uh, I, I, I'm really fired up and I'm looking forward to a podcast with you young men and, um, and Edward, because we have to do something just talking about it. I don't know how much longer I'll be here. Just talking about it is not enough. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Hey, I just want to say that uh, I resonate with Peter was saying, and one thing, everybody he mentioned, all of them got their wealth from Chicago, all of them Chicagoans. So mm -hmm. yeah, they should give back big like that. That ain't nothing. Yeah, and thank you very much for coming up, Peter Bell. And thank you, Harold, for having this marvelous show. All right. Sister Taifa, right. and then we got Eric Campbell, and that should wrap okay. us up. Taifa? All right. All right. Thank you so very much. I'll just say freedom by any means necessary. By any means necessary. I'll say. All right. All right. Eric Campbell, you there? You want to unmute? <clears throat> All right. I guess not. So, okay. Mr. Bell, you got the final word. All right. I just want to take this time out to thank everybody, man. This has been a fabulous, fabulous group. And I know we are running out of time, but I just want to, you know, say Memorial Day is tomorrow. And I just want to send tributes out to my brother, uh, Earl, Sergeant Earl K. Bell, a military policeman and a sergeant on the D.C. Uh, police department. He, he um, uh, confronted uh, racism in, in Mannheim, Germany, when he was there. He led uh, a group of soldiers on a boycott downtown where the bars, these clubs would not admit black soldiers, but they would admit uh, white soldiers. And uh, it was a hell of an uproar. And he decided then that he was not going to re-enlist and come home and join uh, the DC police department where he encountered the exact same racism, the exact same racism. They let him get to sergeant and they blocked him from there, would not, would not let him advance any further. And of course he was in a terrible, uh, accident on the way to work one morning after they had suspended him for knocking out a white uh, cracker in the police department and um, uh, finally uh, died in the nursing home. Also, my younger brother, William, who I've never really given any credit for being in the United States Marine Corps of First uh, Pacific uh, uh, for, for several years, man. Uh, I want to pay tribute to these brothers who stood up, who are no longer here. I had four brothers. One was a U.S. Marshal, and I'm the last man standing, and I'm standing for them. And uh, once again, man, I want to, you know, say that we got to keep fighting. We got to keep standing. Yes. We, we cannot be scared, man. And as I always say, as you guys know, that you cannot soar with eagles 
if you're going to hang out with chickens. chickens. So we didn't, we didn't have any chickens on this podcast today. So we are going to keep speaking up, man, because that's that's what it's all about. Gary, thank you for uh, another great show and uh, looking forward to being back here next Sunday. And Dr. Judy Fisher, we're going to catch up with you, baby. Yes, <laughs> looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You on the radar. Okay. <laughs> until next Sunday, I'm Harold Bell, and you can color me gone. Be <laughs> safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, goodbye. Hi, I'm Harold Bell. My wife Hattie and I found the nonprofit organization in 1968, shortly after the riots that almost destroyed my hometown, Washington, D.C. The program caters to the needs of at-risk children as it relates to social services such as education, law enforcement, drug abuse, gang-related violence, and other antisocial behavior.